Great. Thank you, Dr. Gleave. And hi, everyone. So good morning. I'm uh, Julie. I'm one of the PGY3s currently here at UBC Urology, and I'm here today to present my talk on deceased donor kidney allocation and international analysis. So let's get started. I just want to thank Dr. Harriman and Dr. Kadatz uh, for all of their help with the talk. So I picked this topic because I've always been very curious about how the allocation process worked and how the kidney ended up in that red box ready for transplant. And certainly I find as I dug into this, this is a very meaty topic that leads into discussions regarding ethics, health systems, and a constant optimization problem. So my goal today is to give you an overview and working knowledge of deceased donor allocation. And we're going to do this in four parts. Uh, first, we're going to discuss classification and terminology, a little bit of background. Then the majority of the talk, we're going to spend comparing and contrasting kidney allocation systems in four regions, BC, Ontario, the US, and the UK. We'll then move on to discussing uh, health inequities, both historic and current in transplant allocation, and finish by talking about novel strategies in allocation, what's uh, coming out in the research now. So first, let's start with some epidemiology and terminology. So in BC, there were 340 kidney transplants last year, which was record-breaking, and of those, 265 were from deceased donors. You can see the most current numbers for transplant waitlists, and you can see that certainly our waitlist numbers are decreasing over the last couple of years, but that being said, patients are still dying on the waitlist, which means we still have scarcity of kidneys. If we look on a national scale, these are numbers from uh, Canada overall in 2020. Uh, and so you can see that, of course, Ontario does more absolute kidney transplants than we do, as seen on that graph on the left. On the graph on the right, however, you can see that if we do a rate per million people, BC actually leads the, the field in Canada. The reason for this there's a couple. The first is, unfortunately, the opioid epidemic gives us uh, a large number of donors to choose from. And also, BC transplant itself is quite good at identifying donors and marginal kidneys, which we'll talk about in a later slide as well. And just to put this into context in an international perspective, that 55 uh, rate per million is quite high even on an international scale as we compare to different regions around the world. That being said, Again, waitlist still exists, and this is just an example of what the waitlists look like across the nation to give you a sense um, that they exist and they're varied throughout provinces. So speaking of the waitlist, how do you get on the waitlist? So B patients are referred to BC transplant by a nephrologist, and these are the criteria. They have to have progressive irreversible renal disease. Uh, they have to have no active malignancy or infection. And there are some malignancies that are not contraindications. For example, prostate cancer that's suitable for active surveillance, recurrent skin cancers. There's a thought that they need to have a life expectancy greater than five years and have to be healthy enough to be able to rehabilitate successfully. That being said, this is also subject to interpretation. And these days, uh, transplants gang referred more and more comorbid patients, and it really becomes a judgment call. And finally, there are social considerations. Can these patients uh, attend rehabilitation? Uh, can they you know, adhere to immunosuppression, attend follow-up, things like that? Once on the wait list, they get serum samples about every month or so whenever they or whenever they have a new sensitizing event like a blood transfusion or a pregnancy in order to keep their immunologic profile up to date. And what do our wait lists look like right now? Well, these are segregated by blood type and you can see they range from under a year for A, which is our shortest wait list, to up to three years for B. It's important to put this into context and to note that these wait times are drastically lower than our U.S. counterparts and lower than most other provinces. And again, like I said before, we have a very active deceased donor organ pool and very aggressive with marginal donors, and that's why we're transplanting so much. So again, we talked about blood types briefly. It's important to remember that you need to match your organ to the recipient's blood type. And I just want to put a quick note in for A1 versus A2 blood types. Um, and this is based on a reactivity to anti-A1 lectin, which exclusively agglutinates A1 cells. So as a result, some possible B candidates can be transplanted with an A2 organ. Uh, that's important as, like I said before, blood type B has the longest wait times. And then, of course, when we talk about organ matching, we have to talk about HLA typing and also panel reactive antibodies. 
So obviously we have to look at HLA matches and mismatches when we're figuring out whether or not an organ is suitable for a particular recipient. But it's also important to think not just of someone's self HLAs, but also their non self HLAs, because patients can have sensitization occurring through exposure. And these exposure events are things like a previous transplant, a blood transfusion, or a pregnancy. And there's a way to quantify this via what we call a CPRA score, so this panel reactive antibody. This is measured as a percentage, and it's the proportion of the donor population to which the recipient will react via pre existing HLA antibodies. So, for example, if you had a CPRA score of 95%, that means that you are very reactive and would react to many different potential donors. It is important to note that with regards to HLA, um, a perfect HLA match does get priority and it does matter because it can limit uh, the amount of immunosuppression a patient needs, but some HLA mismatches are less clinically relevant than others and so it doesn't need to be a perfect match in order to give someone an organ. And it is important to note that uh, those with high CPRA scores, we de deem them HSP, highly sensitized patients. And HSP patients can make up between 25 to 33% of the wait list uh, for kidney transplants. So they are a very important population to consider and something we'll talk about more through the course of this talk. In terms of types of deceased donors, uh, we have two. We have NDD, which is neurological determination of death, which is a neurologic death, and DCD, or donation after circulatory death, um, which is when you withdraw life-sustaining treatment after significant brain damage. You'll note that in BC, uh, it's important to note the difference between an NDD and a DCD because a DCD has a component of warm ischemic time, and in BC, we set a cutoff of two hours. So if the warm ischemic time is, is more than two hours, uh, the kidneys are not viable for transplant. This does tend to vary by region, by practice. Um, so it is really tough to know how long we should be waiting, but that's the cutoff that we've done. So DCD is, has warm ischemia, NDD typically does not. There's also another criteria, which is expanded criteria donation or ECD. These are kidneys coming from any donors 60 years or older, or donors from the age of 50 to 59 with two of the following, hypertension, death by a stroke, or an elevated creatinine. This matters because ECDs have a shorter graft survival rate. So this is a study just showing graft survival from 2016. Adjusted graft survival is 8% lower at one year and 5 to 20% lower at three to five years after transplantation. And this study showed if we look at transplanting an ECD kidney versus an SCD or standard criteria donor kidney in a younger population, those under the age of 60, it can actually lead to an increased all-cause mortality. And so you see those are the dashed lines here and the gray being, um, uh, sorry, the uh, dashed line, the light gray lines, the SCDs and the ECDs for the young population, increased all-cause mortality here. So now that we've talked about defining some of the terminology, let's talk about allocation itself. Uh, the next few slides come from a presentation by Dr. Timothy Pruitt at the University of Minnesota. And I find this analogy a good one for us to base this discussion on ethics around as we talk about allocation. So this is a ship, a very famous ship that sank. Uh, most of you know it, it's the Titanic. And so it's important to note that in the Titanic, uh, they famously did not have enough lifeboats for everyone on the ship. And even then those lifeboats launched with only 650 people. So 68% of their possible capacity. And some of those lifeboats didn't uh, launch properly and didn't save anyone. Some interesting anecdotes from the Titanic tragedy is that the world's richest man was turned away from a lifeboat because they prioritized women and children. And even so that lifeboat left uh, partially filled and thus he passed away on the ship. However, the captain jumped onto a lifeboat uh, that was, again, not fully filled, and he lived but was forever uh, publicly disgraced for not sinking the ship. So, you know, you can look back on this historic event over 100 years ago and say, what should have been done? Again, there were not enough boats for all the passengers. They were a limited or scarce resource. Uh, so there's no single right answer for who should have gotten a lifeboat. But there's certainly plenty of wrong answers. So anything that decreased the functional capacity of the life 
boats, uh, capsizing, leaving empty spots, overloading, and such. And the same sort of thing, we can think about uh, allocation systems and distributing kidneys. We want to make sure we're not going into wrong answers, things that are excessively wasteful. But then as we look back at the Titanic and we see that they prioritize women and children, are some people worth more than others? Do we prioritize women and children, those who are frail, those of high financial worth, like that millionaire that didn't make it onto the lifeboat, intellectual worth, ethnicity? Do we benefit people either directly or indirectly due to geography, class, or access? You'll recall that the Titanic was um, segregated into first class, second class, and third class passengers, and they did not all have the same survival rate. And then the question is, well, then do we save spots in the boat for vulnerable populations first? And all of these questions are true of a boat accident 100 years ago, but are also true of kidney allocation. So when we talk about kidney allocation, there's a wide variety of goals possible when you're building an allocation system. You can try to maximize potential added life years. You can try to make the most efficient use of the organs. You can try to create an equitable, equitable distribution for underserved populations. You can try to maximize the number of kidneys transplanted, or you can say, let's do a first come first serve basis. And again, there's no one right answer, but this can lead to a lot of differences in allocation systems. In terms of ethics, the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network in America created this thing called a final rule in 1998, which is sort of an ethical guideline on how to create organ allocation systems. They say allocation should be based on sound medical judgment, seek to achieve the best use of donated organs, uh, try to avoid wasting organs or doing futile transplants and promoting access to transplantation, and to promote efficient management of organ placement, which is all well and good, but still pretty vague. And so you can see how this can lead to many different allocation systems. And I found kidney especially interesting because it does bear some differences from other organ allocation systems. Uh, the first one is this sense of immunologic considerations and this idea of highly sensitized patients. The second important difference is the fact that we have dialysis. So because dialysis is a bridge to transplant for those eligible for the wait list, you have to take into account wait times, not just who is the most sick and needs the organ soonest. That being said, Patients who have comorbidities that affect weightless survival will also affect allograft survival as well. So ultimately, it's a balance. It's a balance between utility, looking at all the differing allograft qualities and figuring out how best to utilize each kidney, but also looking at equity and how can we make sure we are not disadvantaging populations that are already underserved. So, now that we've defined this thorny problem, how are different systems seeking to address it? Let's start with British Columbia. So as a broad overview, a summary of the BC deceased donor algorithm overview, this is an age-based stratification algorithm based on the age of the donor for which we do include priority groups and wait times based on the start time of dialysis. So let's say that you have a potential kidney donor. What makes sure that they are actually eligible to be a kidney donor? So one is age. If they are over the age of 80 for an NDD or 75 for an NDD, they will not be eligible for a donation. Uh, second is HIV positivity or chronic renal failure. We don't want those kidneys. There are some relative contraindications as well including active hepatitis B and malignancy. Acute kidney injury can be a relative contraindication, but this can often be overruled with the idea that oftentimes these kidneys can recover after transplantation. And what if you're thinking about transplanting to a pediatric recipient? Well, then the guidelines are a bit more strict in terms of age, a lower age cutoff, in terms of they didn't, they never used to take any DCD kidneys. Now they'll accept some DCD kidneys, depending on the quality of the kidney. Hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, all rule outs, uh, chronic renal failure, or any P creatinine over 300. Okay, you found your kidney. What next? 
Uh, then you do a virtual cross match is done by the computer in order to come up with a short list of who is eligible for this kidney. Then the coordinator and the on-call nephrologist pick the top three candidates per kidney, and then a proper flow cross match is done in the immunology lab. And this is a quite a resource intensive process. It involves the immunology lab being ready, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So I just want to go through this algorithm and uh, talk you through it. And then we'll show you the other sort of age stratifications. They're quite similar to this one. So this algorithm in particular is for a deceased donor 35 years or younger. So this is a young donor. Um, so first of all, if there is a national candidate that is highly sensitized, the right kidney will be allocated to that. And we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. Then the left kidney will go to one of these priority groups if they exist. If not, then it goes to any patient between the age of 18 to 54 based on wait time from startup dialysis. And if not, then it will go to an older recipient over the age of 55 based on wait time. Who are these priority groups? So those that are medically urgent. So that, that would be those for whom dialysis isn't really an option. They're running out of access, things like that. Uh, highly sensitized patients. Again, those for whom it's very difficult to find a match. Uh, combined kidney and other organ transplantation. Uh, pediatric population. A kidney post extra renal transplant. And the reason for that is because there has been some evidence showing that lung transplants have worse outcomes if they stay on dialysis. Those for whom they were previously a living donor themselves and now have kidney failure. And those who have had a previous living uh, donor kidney transplant, but had primary non-function after 90 days. And the reason for that is otherwise they would have to accrue uh, dialysis time on the wait list. So this is the same algorithm for an older donor, but a still an SCD standard criteria donor and same sort of thing. So one kidney is allocated nationally, the other one goes to the priority groups. And if not, then it goes to any patient over the age of 18 based on wait time. And this is for the older patients. Uh, so these are all ECD, kid uh, ECD kidneys, again, one goes to HSP, one goes to the priority group if they would like it. And then if not, this goes to an older patient, a patient greater than 60. And if not, then potentially a younger patient. It's important to note that we will actually transplant organs that are hepatitis C positive. Um, that being said, it's a bit of a strict criteria. They cannot be an ECD organ. And these recipients will then be put on medication directly after the transplant for hepatitis C. So they need pharmacare coverage and the patients actually need to consent for transplantation. And this is really an ability for patients to jump the queue if they're willing to accept a hepatitis C positive organ. Now that we've done a summary of the BC system, you might ask, well, why bother? Why do an age-based system at all? So recall the previous slide on ECD kidneys increasing all-cause mortality for younger patients. And so we think of patients as young recipients or old recipients, young ones being the ones for whom a life expectancy is larger than the duration of graft survival. So they will outlive their graft. Old recipients will die with their functioning graft, likely. And so as a result, their life expectancy will not be shortened by giving grafts with shorter survival duration. So we're trying to maximize the use of each allograft. Now, I've teased this quite a bit. Let's finally talk about this HSP or highly sensitized patient program. This is a national registry done across Canada for all patients who have a CPRA of greater than or equal to 95%. So again, reacting uh, with antibodies to greater than 95% of all donors. Uh, so currently in BC, only one kidney is offered in the national HSP match per donor, but this will be changing in the near future uh, to offer both kidneys out, out, of, out of province if wanted. This table is just uh, a visual representation of the current highly sensitized patient waitlist in Canada. There's 806 on the waitlist currently, 373 are currently active. And you can see, as one would expect, as you get into um, higher CPRAs, there's more people on the waitlist because they're harder to match. Uh, 
Now, does this program work? Well, first of all, you have to consider the fact that patients with higher CPRAs oftentimes have to wait longer on the wait list. You can see here, this is years on dialysis. It goes up to 10 and the increasing CPRAs are on the left side. So you can see here a CPRA of 100%. You're waiting you know, eight to nine years on dialysis before you get a kidney transplant. But if you look at the amount of HSB transplants that have been done, this is just in 2022. There's been 58 done. And the teal is those that are cross province or out of province. And you can see they make up the majority of the HSB transplants. So because we have this ability to match people across provinces, um, these people who have to normally wait a very long time on the wait list are getting more transplants than they would if they just had to stick within their own province as seen on the gray. Speaking of provinces, um, let's switch tax now and talk briefly about Ontario, which is a province I picked because, again, it does more absolute number of transplants than we do. So I was curious to see how their allocation system worked. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to highlight that are key differences from BC. Uh, the first is this idea of a regional distribution. So they break up their organ distribution into uh, five regions. And so one kidney per donor will always stay regional. And the other one is Ontario wide or goes towards that national HSP pool. The other thing to note is the fact that they have a separate candidate list for ECD uh, donors. Their ECD criteria is a little bit different. It's a KDPI system, which we will get to shortly. And those recipients need to be older or have significant comorbidities and need to consent for ECD. So because it's a separate list entirely, uh, patients are actually incentivized to take an ECD kidney because they will get a shorter wait time. So that's different than BC. In BC, we don't necessarily do this because our wait times are so short. So now let's talk about America and UNOS. Uh, America, obviously a much bigger system. They did uh, 24,600 transplants in 2021. And as a result, their system is a lot more granular. And I think it has some nuances that are really interesting uh, to discuss. So it's called the kidney allocation system or KAS, quite straightforward. And it was introduced in 2014. Um, you can get on the wait list at the time of dialysis, or if you have any measurement of a GFR under 20 or an immediate non-function of kidney allograft. And this is interesting because they only need one lab value with a GFR of under 20, meaning that they could have an AKI and have some recovery and still be potentially eligible for a deceased donor kidney. So the first score I want to talk about that is done on this wait list is the EPTS score. So this is for all potential recipients. They get an expected post-transplant survival score. This is based on age, time on dialysis, whether or not they have diabetes, and if they have a history of previous solid organ transplant. You see on the right here, a Kaplan-Meier curve uh, by EPTS score. And you can see as that number increases, you have a higher EPTS score. Uh, your patient's estimated patient survival time decreases. So these are sicker patients. They also score donors with something called a KDPI score. This is a really big deal in the allocation world. Um, so it's calculated from 10 values, age, height, weight, ethnicity, hypertension, diabetes, uh, stroke causing death, serum creatinine, hepatitis C status, and DCD status. You may think these look a little similar to uh, the ECD criteria, and that's because the KDPI is similar to the ECD criteria. It's basically a paradigm shift. So instead of saying, well, we either have standard criteria donors or ECD uh, donors, and they're a binary, this really makes it a spectrum We're scoring all donors now. And so technically, to get into the nitty gritty, the full KDPI includes some factors that occur during transplant, um, but most people will just use the donor only information. And you may hear something called a KDRI, the kidney donor risk index, and basically the two scores are related. The KDRI is the raw score, the relative risk of graft failure, and this is translated into the KDPI, which is a cumulative percentage scale. For example, Kidneys from a donor with a KDPI of 90% means they have a KDRI higher than 90% of recovered kidneys. And that reference population is all recovered kidneys from the U.S. in the last year. So a lower value is increased donor quality and expected longevity. So the reason we score both kid, uh, donors and recipients is because we can match them. And if we match scores, the best kidneys can go to the patients who need them the longest and worst kidneys will go to patients who may not need them as long. And here again is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. Again, higher KDPI, worse graph survival time. 
Uh, the five-year graph survival time for a KDPI of 0 to 20% is approximately 90%. And for a KDPI of 86 to 100%, it drops down to about 60%. So how does this work in practice? So pediatric recipients, they aim to only get KDPIs less than or equal to 35%, so the top 35% of kidneys. And like I said, if your KDPI is under 20%, that's offered to the top 20% of EPTS. So trying to match the top 20%. Also, recipients in the US need to consent for a kidney with a KDPI greater than 85%. And again, this figure here shows the estimated graph half-lives um, from a KDPI of 20% to one of over 85%. And you can see really the difference in half-life is significant. Um, no, I want to make a quick note about this change in uh, pediatric recipients only getting the top 35% of kidneys. It's interesting to note that studies have shown, shown that KAS has increased transplantation access for teenage patients and highly sensitized patients, but has actually re resulted in decreased access for some of the youngest children uh, being transplanted. That being said, you know, going back to adults and these poor quality kidneys, uh, why would anyone want a KDPI kidney of over 85%? Well, it shows that marginal kidneys can still provide benefit. This was a study done in 2019. And over here, you have patients with a good EPTS or poor EPTS. These are, again, potential recipients. And here you have donor kidneys, again, better quality kidney, worse quality kidney. You can see even if we were to take the worst matchup, a great uh, recipient with a poor quality uh, donor, which we wouldn't really do, um, you would see uh, you would see that it provides a five year survival risk a uh, five year survival risk difference compared to just being on the wait list itself of fourteen point seven percent. So really, any kidney you get is better than just being on the wait list. And this is another table uh, from that same study. So again, blue is better survival. We have on the y-axis, the EPTS score, the score of the recipient. On the x-axis, the KDPI score of the donor. And you can see both five and 10 year survival, it tends to pretty much almost always be better than just being on the wait list. So now that we have this score, this KDPI, good question is, well, how predictive is it? And there's a way to measure this. It's called the C statistic or con concordance statistic. It ranges from 0.5 to 1.0. It's used to measure predictive accuracy, and it's related to the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, an example of which is shown here. So 0.5 means it's completely random, not really predictive at all. 1.0 would be perfect, and higher is more predictive. So 0.7 is considered good. KDPI has a C statistic of basically 0 0.6. So, yeah. And then, sorry, in terms of HSP, how do uh, patients deal with uh, HSP in the US? So they use a sliding scale point system for any CPRA greater than or equal to 20%. Um, this is different than the old system, which gave a flat bump of points if your CPRA was greater than 80%. But now as soon as you hit 20, you start getting a little bit of a boost. If your CPRA is greater than or equal to 98%, you get local, regional, and national priority. This has the added benefit of incentivizing all programs when they list their candidates to report all unacceptable antigens per candidate to bump up their CPRA to give them a couple of extra points. Then finally, how do they deal with pediatrics uh, in the US system? So they definitely will not take any KDPI over 85%. They're also given uh, points as well and prioritize for perfect HLA matches and prioritize the local, regional and national level. Finally, let's talk about the UK. So the UK previously had NDD and DCD being separate wait lists, but that has changed recently. They've introduced a new system in September 2019. It's called R4D4, uh, not R2D2, R4D4. Um, and for this uh, system, the waiting time starts from dialysis initiation, and they have a special priority group called Tier A, and that's the hard to match or disadvantaged patients. We're talking a wait time of over seven years, CPRA of 100%. Uh, a matchability score goes from one to 10, 10 is the highest, and it takes into account blood type, HLA, and antigens. So what is this R4D4 score? So 
once again, they are also scoring donors and recipients uh, based on different factors. So you see here their DRI donor risk score has seven factors. They include things like CMV status, um, like the hospitalization, and their RRI, again, recipient risk score is similar to the EPTS, but slightly different. They look at length of time on dialysis, diabetes, and whether or not they were already on the Di on dialysis when placed on the risk list. As a result, you can sort your donors and recipients into D1 to D4 or R1 to R4. R1, D1 is lowest risk, D4, R4 highest risk, and they attempt to match risk quartiles of donors and recipients. How do they deal with pediatrics across the pond? Um, so th those are patients under the age of 18, similar to BC, and they say, well, they're only eligible for donors that are under 50 years old. So now that we've had a tour of the various allocation systems, I want to address what's one of the most important factors in allocation, and indeed in transplant, uh, with quite a lot of research behind it, and that's equity in transplant allocation. So the first disadvantaged population I want to talk about are those highly sensitized patients. So as I've shown you previously, the wait times for them are longer. and Previously, they may have had to wait many years for a match. This is important to note because women are disproportionately affected as highly sensitized patients due to the fact that pregnancy is a sensitizing event. So there are, have been novel techniques, including increased priority in the system. And we've seen this in pretty much all of the systems we've surveyed um, in this slideshow so far, as well as this idea of paired exchange. So being able to daisy chain uh, donors in order to make sure that a highly sensitized patient can get an immunologic match. As well, there's this concept of novel desensitization strategies. So can we desensitize these highly sensitized patients uh, from some of their antibodies while they're waiting on the wait list? It's important to note that for example, this novel strategy done by KAS to improve access to highly sensitized patients has worked for some, but not all HSPs. This graph here is from a study in 2019 showing the relative deceased donor kidney transplant rates uh, for CPRA groups post implementation of the new system versus pre implementation of the new system. So, you, you know, one would be that there was no change in transplantation. Uh, after KS. And over here, we have months after the system. And so we see here, these red lines are the hardest to match, your 99.5s, your 99.9%. And they are definitely having more transplants than they had in the old system. But that being said, you have here the CPRA of 80 to 89%, so not quite as hard to match. And they're actually not getting as many transplants as they did before. So it's not a perfect system by any means. So let's talk about another disadvantaged group, and that's uh, the concept, concept of racial disparity. So black patients are four times more likely to have kidney disease than Caucasian patients. This has been shown in many studies and in the renal data systems as well, epidemiologically. And so there was a US study done in 2021 and showed a large racial disparity, interestingly, only in living donor transplant, but not in deceased donor transplant. And the reasons behind this have not been fully elucidated yet, but this does beg the question, there's a racial disparity in living donor transplantation should efforts be made to increase the odds of allocating deceased kidneys to certain ethnicities in order to help balance the scale? Should they be given priority or extra points in the system? And this is also a problem in Canada as well. So Canadian studies have shown that Indigenous patients are less likely to receive a renal transplant. Uh, this is a really interesting study done in 2013, um, and it basically shows, especially younger Indigenous patients, these ones over here, have uh, this is a relative rate compared to Caucasian pa patients and younger patients between the age of 18 to 40 are less than half as likely to receive a graft as older patients. And similar studies have shown disparities um, between other ethnic groups, including uh, South Asians and East Indians as well. And then I also want to talk about access to waitlist. So if you aren't on the waitlist, you know, none of this other allocation stuff really matters. And the waitlist is a major bottleneck to access. So some patients with the top 20% EPTS, again, those that would be eligible for some of the best uh, kidneys in the States, the KDPI under 20%, are not listed in a timely manner. This study done in 2021 20, uh, shows that 
61% of patients were listed post dialysis and they lost their uh, premium status within 30 months versus 18% who were preemptively listed. And in three years, if they followed them and 5% of those patients who were listed post dialysis received a transplant versus 26% of patients who were preemptively listed. So losing that premium status means not only are you losing access to some of the quote unquote best kidneys with those with a lower KDPI, but you're also actually decreasing the chance that you're going to get transplanted in a timely manner. And from a Canadian point of view, uh, there was a study done in 2019 that showed that referral was lower likelihood for patients who were older, who were female, and for whom their dialysis center was more than 100 kilometers to transplant centers. Interestingly, this study didn't show any relation to race or waitlist time or neighborhood income, although some studies in the U.S. have shown that. And I want to show you um, this image from the uh, Canadian study to show this is the referral rate for 100 patient years of dialysis. And you can just see just how heterogeneous it is across Canada. So patients aren't having equal access to being referred onto the wait list, which means they're not having necessarily equal access to deceased donor kidneys. And in terms of geographic distribution, um, America has actually made a recent change to this. They've changed distribution units in early 2020. So previously they used something called DSAs, donation service areas. These are almost like health authorities. They're geographic areas. And if you're within the, ge the same geographic area as a donor, you're considered a potential recipient. But that being said, they've changed this geographic boundary. And instead now they say, well, if you're within a certain radius, 250 nautical mile radius from the donor hospital, you're considered as an eligible recipient. And potential recipients are then given proximity points. And the goal was to improve access for children, ethnic minorities, highly sensitized patients, again, those who were disadvantaged historically. And so, you know, does this work? And I think it's really interesting that the U.S. does something uh, that not a lot of other places do and that they actually measure, uh, try to measure equity to allocation. So they have this thing called an access to transplant score, and it's a single number that summarizes an active candidate's relative likelihood of receiving a deceased donor transplant. And they measure the standard deviation of this, and this reflects disparities in wait time. Um, and you can see here from 2010 to 2022 that the ATS standard deviation significantly decreased after this first star, which was the implementation of the new kidney allocation system in 2014. And even after the second star, which is that geographic distribution change to that 250 nautical mile radius. It's interesting that UNOS has seen that the most noteworthy risk adjusted differences in access to kidney transplants correspond to five key factors. So geographic area, CPRA, whether or not you're highly sensitized, blood type, prior kidney transplant, and age. And we've talked about a lot of these populations as we've gone through this concept of equity and allocation. I then want to spend the rest of our time talking about upcoming models. So one of the ongoing issues with kidney allocation is trying to find a score that will predict graft survival in order to optimize allocation, make sure you're giving people um, allographs where you can predict how long they're going to survive for. The KDPI score, recall, only has a C-score of 0.6, which is not that predictive. So the question is, can we do better? So this is a systematic review of models done in 2022, showing just a lot of different alternatives to KDPI. A lot of other validated models looking at pre-transplant variables have been proposed. You see here on the left, basically a summary of all of their different C statistics, and they range from between 0.637 to 0.71. So a lot of these are better uh, than KDPI, but have not been fully validated yet. Some take into account uh, different risk factors, things like peripheral vascular disease, race, race H HLA match, et cetera. It'll be really interesting to see if any of these scores become the hot new score that's used to influence uh, allocation algorithms going forward. Also, when you talk about you know, scoring, predicting, uh, survival, things like that. You can't help but talk about machine learning algorithms in this day and age. Uh, and certainly studies have come to try to see, can machine learning help us with predicting death censored graph survival and predicting which allographs will work well? And so this was a recurrent neural network study on a data set of 20 years of US recipients. And the predictions were evaluated, again, using the C-score. 
And so it's interesting to see if you look here, you know, the C scores are ranging around 0.65. Again, to put this into context, better than the KDPI, but oftentimes by standard definition, a good prediction score is one with a C statistic of 0.7. So I think it's still a ways to go, but interesting to see how this will progress in the future. And so in conclusion, uh, we've talked about several different models, four in particular used to allocate deceased donor kidney allografts. Um, and as we've compared and contrasted these different systems, we've talked about doing an ECD uh, category versus using the KDPI. We've talked about age matching to try to optimize allograft survival. We've talked about scoring recipients as well with EPTS or R4D4. We've talked about priority groups and how they help provide equity for vulnerable populations like pediatrics or disadvantaged populations like highly sensitized populations. We've talked about balancing equity and utility and how that continues to be a focus of novel allocation systems. And we've talked about how new techniques are being developed to predict allograft survival to improve allocation efficiency. Overall, as long as kidneys remain a scarce resource and people are dying while waiting for a transplant, there will always be a need to continue iterating and improving on allocation systems as we try to make the most of the lifeboats that we've got. And with that, I'd like to open for questions. Thank you very much. Very nicely uh, presented, Julie. Um, you know, uh, again, a, a broad coverage of something that uh, is hidden to many of us, since uh, most urologists are not <laughs> intimately associated with the, this aspect of, uh, of um, urology. And I think, you know, the, I think BC is, at least from what I can gather in your presentation, doing quite well from a global perspective. And a lot of it is, you know, falling within urology, whereas I think in other areas, this is uh, moving into other sort of transplant uh, broader transplant program. So open up for questions for Julie. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Um, Julie, great presentation. Uh, that's a great overview. And uh, um, I, I really do like the analogy to, to the Titanic uh, with, because it's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult question because, you know, for, for us in BC, we've done so well with our, um, with our uh, donor, um, rates and referrals. It's been a, a really great push over the last decade in terms of improving awareness in the ICUs and appropriate referrals and uh, triaging. That uh, that's really increased our deceased donation rates. Um, but it's 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 almost come to the point where um, th there's so many deceased donors for our population that um, that uh, we're getting a bit more selective. You know, be before. Um, you know, it could typically be quite aggressive with accepting, for example, page, you know, younger patients with, you know, aneuric AKI, for instance. And now, now we just know that there's going to be another deceased donor of, of, of better quality <coughs> that it does, it, it does really impact your allocation. Um, and um, uh, so it's 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 kind of a catch twenty two that it's 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 so good that it's changing the way we we allocate as well now. Thank you, Doctor. And it's it's an interesting thing to consider for sure because I think BC is almost unique in that area um, because of like you said how how high our rates are compared you know nationally or internationally. So do are we, Michael? And what your comment on suggests that you know the. Uh, uh, the uh, bottlenecks in increasing um, um, you know, transplantation rates here is not necessarily um, a, a lack of donors. You're being more selective. And if that's the case, are we also uh, shipping any, uh, how many of our kidneys that we uh, harvest here go elsewhere across the country? Did you cover that um, at all, Julie? Um, I didn't look specifically at statistics on how many of our kidneys go outside of can uh, outside of the province for non HSP related reasons. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Ng happens to know. I would say typically we're we're probably more we're two of the most aggressive programs in the country, right? So so we'll uh, you know we we had started the hepatitis C program in its infancy, and and so we typically would accept. Uh, kidneys that other 
programs and uh, provinces uh, may discard. Um, but um, yeah, that, that in terms of shipping out a province, it's um, not so much in terms of um, um, allocation, it's more in terms of, um, of uh, surgeon, surgeon call schedules right now. <laughs> Yeah, in general, traditionally, I totally agree with Mike that we would we would just keep all here in province that we can because we uh, we want to get our patients transplanted. Uh, what, one thing that's interesting about the talk that I always find interesting in this this subject is uh, Julie spent a lot of time on HSP, highly sensitized patients, and that's that's a real hodgepodge uh, group of folks. It includes certainly a really disadvantaged group in the uh, in the women who were pregnant who got sensitized and don't have a chance at transplant, but it also includes like the yahoos who are non-compliant with medication, who uh, burned a kidney already, and who you, you have to wonder, does that person deserve a second chance at transplantation compared to somebody who's never had a, trans, a transplantation? And all allocation systems actually give those type of folks priority as well. So uh, there's no perfect system. Uh, disadvantaged groups include uh, truly disadvantaged people and people who are sort of free riders into that uh, uh, subcategory. And it's... Uh, you know, if you want to be a transplant professional, you really need to learn this language of allocation because it allows crosstalk with our nephrology colleagues, and it is uh, uh, it's just a vital foundation for how we how we conduct business. So, at what level are urologists involved with this process? Are you uh, at the um, implementation end, or are you involved with determining suitability? So here in B, here in BC, our our nephrologists take the lead and and they make the matches uh, and they they're the ones who get woken up at night and uh, and they determine what kidney goes into what recipient and then they review that with us in urology and we hear the story and uh, we always have a chance to veto if we're like this is a terrible idea guys uh, we we should not put that kidney into this patient uh, they'll they'll uh, often respect that it'd be very rare because. Uh, fortunately, most times things work out in, in kidney transplants. So it, it would be a pretty rare situation that we would object to a, to a match. Uh, how, so that's here in BC. In the United States, the surgeons are, are, are king down there and uh, all allocation, all decisions on, uh, on kidneys going into recipients, that all goes through the sur surgeons. So during my fellowship, I would do allocation and I would determine uh, which kidneys we were accepting, which we were discarding and what patients we were putting those into. So it's uh, uh, certainly globally, uh, this is something that surgeons are, and urologists are involved in. Uh, but here in BC, we're, we're involved in it at a, as a second step. Other, other questions for, for Julie? So I have another question, Julie, is, you know, in, in this a, a big part and, you know, the Milken Institute has looked at this, how many Canadians leave our country to get um, access to care for hips, for knees, for cancer, for a lot of things in the medical tourism world, whether or not it's in India, other parts of Asia, or the US, it's a, it's a significant and underreported phenomenon. Is this captured in the transplant world? How many Canadians are leaving Canada to get a transplant elsewhere? That's a great question. And I couldn't find 